do want to address some concerns about social justice within uh, a medical intervention that is taking place or has taken place uh, in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, in Eastern and Southern Africa, since about 2007 up until the present moment, which is voluntary medical male circumcision for HIV prevention. And I want to give you a little bit of background to this global health uh, intervention. Uh, but I also want to give you a little bit of background to male circumcision in Kenya, which is an area that I have been in some ways in a long journey uh, kind of researching uh, through various periods of time. And it would seem that the pandemic uh, put the very last phase of this research on hold. Um, simply because you know, obviously travel wasn't possible and, uh, and, and actually I'd had a, an experience with funding at that point. Um, so it kind of came to a, a pause. And I think that pause has actually been really beneficial for me because it's allowed me to amalgamate a, a lot of um, thoughts that I've had over the years about this topic of male circumcision in Kenya. And uh, it goes back actually quite a long time, I realized, about 20 years ago when I was uh, just starting my PhD research and, um, you know, I was involved in a community where male circumcision uh, was part of a, a ritual complex, part of changing uh, sort of adolescent boys' bodies and, and inculcating new sensibilities about being a man and a kind of rite of passage, if you will, to put it in, in kind of uh, sort of kind of a term I maybe don't exactly subscribe to, but somehow it makes sense. It's a sort of transitional uh, point in the life course. And I was researching generational relationships, and part of the focus was on circumcision practices in the past and in the present and potentially into the future through various things. And that occupied at least a part of my PhD research back in probably from about 2000 to 2003 when I was doing fieldwork. And then um, when I came to the OU, I joined a project, an ESRC funded project on Kenyan constitutional change and cultural rights. And I kind of picked up the story again on, on uh, male circumcision. At that time, I was looking at uh, violent, forcible circumcisions and rights. Um, so looking at the tension between cultural rights and individual rights and what would happen when a person was being disciplined and they were being uh, forcibly circumcised as a way of correcting them. It was very much a, a kind of political act. It, it happened during uh, moments of political violence, but it also happens in a much more everyday sense when, say, for example, a husband is not doing what he's supposed to doing, and he happens to be an uncircumcised man in a circumcising community. Uh, quite often he is outed and they're circumcised, but these uh, forcibly, and these take place in you know particular contexts. So I was looking at that. Uh, around the year 2016. And during that time, I, I kind of stumbled into this massive global health intervention where, you know, it was astounding. It astounded me to learn that there was a, a target of 20 million, uh, 20 million men between the ages of 15 and, um, and 49 where there was um, targeted for medical uh, male circumcision for HIV prevention. I didn't realize the scale of it, and so I, I became very, very interested in that. And I put in a, a bid for a Welcome Trust uh, grant, and I was successful in the initial stages. And so, the sort of long and long and short of this is that I've been looking at male circumcision comparatively, but also in Kenya for quite some time. And it just came, the pandemic kind of gave me the opportunity to reflect. And I thought, well, you know, I'm sitting on kind of this mountain of information, this mountain of experience. And I want to say something about being caught up in this very controversial type of uh, topic and, and what, it, what it means to be a researcher inside of all of these issues. Um, so that was kind of my main motivation. And so I'm going to revisit this through a book. And so it's going to occupy me for the next um, short time. But I want to give you a little bit of context about male circumcision because not everyone is really aware of the extent of it. And for some people, uh, even talking about genital cutting evokes some strong, uh, emotive, even visceral types of feelings. And, and that's totally fine and normal. And it, and it, and, or it might be that the opposite. It might be that, that someone finds it a kind of exotic uh, uh, topic and wonders why the researcher is getting involved in it. So I want to give you a little bit of background to the, the, the topic 
um, and specifically the context of male circumcision in, in Kenya. We might think of it as um, kind of a traditional male ritual circumcision. Um, but of course, one of the things about male circumcision in these cultural contexts is it's very dynamic and it changes historically so that you know, what we see now is certainly not what was practiced 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 60 years ago. It's, it's constantly evolving and changing according to the wider political economic context. And we have to see that. So the medicalization of male circumcision in Kenya has been a long-term process that has its roots in medical missionary work way back in the 1930s and has continued in one form or the other to the present. Um, and in those questions about male traditional circumcision in a country like Kenya, you can actually say that the majority of people, majority of men, uh, by the time that they are entering their last years of high school, that's secondary school, that they have been circumcised, the majority. And there are some communities that have defined themselves as non-circumcising. And there are various reasons for that. There are various cultural and there are various social reasons for why communities have, if you will, resisted being pulled into this sort of national uh, sort of cultures of, of circumcision. And that becomes important when I, I'm going to shift the discussion a little bit about HIV prevention and this new global health initiative, because the communities that are traditionally non-circumcising have been the subject of, of this particular intervention. And I'm going to come to that and some of the reasons why that, but I wanted to give first a picture of traditional male circumcision, for lack of a, a better word, because that area allows us to focus more on social justice and also on on an important aspect of social justice, which, which I'm very interested in, which is the social relational aspect. Is that, that in other words, that social justice for, from the perspective I take is very much about the relationships. It's kind of an ethnographic approach. It's about, it's a sociological approach about how relationships in, 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 in households, uh, how intimate relationships, how relationships in schools, how relationships in prisons, how those uh, are related to circumcision and how those evoke justice issues. And so we're getting into the realm of culture and law and rights. It focuses on some of the issues that I, that I want to address as an introduction. And one of them is about provision. Um, in households, uh, circumcision in a household, when a boy is between the ages of 14 and 16, let's say, in many communities in Kenya, He's invited to be um, circumcised or not invited. Sometimes they lobby to be circumcised because when you get circumcised, you can enter into sexual relations. You start to have a certain independence and autonomy from your parents. But the actual moment of circumcision is, is a point where all the family are involved, all the community are involved uh, in these, uh, these rituals and these operations and in the processes of providing food and building materials and clothing to these boys who are going to become transformed socially by this, um, this ritual. And you can see this is an old picture, uh, was taken on the coast of Kenya uh, amongst a, a Kamba community. And you can see a much younger boy. So there was some, a lot of variation in terms of the age at which uh, children were circumcised. But certainly um, it would have been perverse to, and it is perverse to many communities even, to think about uh, circumcising an infant, which we know is very normative in other, other, um, other um, sort of backgrounds and, and cultures, particularly America, uh, where neonatal circumcision is kind of a norm. It's performed in hospitals. But here, this boy um, belongs to a community where there is a slight um, younger age at which um, boys are community. But I'm just putting this image there because it, it is more about kind of the masculinity and the provision of, of the services or services, the provision of the of the the, the ability or the, the opportunity to have this ritual, so they can pass from one stage of life to the other. Um, just going to go forward a little bit. There in Kenya, there seems to be kind of two clear categories, or there is two clear categories of different kinds of circumcision. I would suggest there's more in common with each other than most people make out, and one of them is uh, traditional. Ritual male circumcision, that's a term that's used in the medical literature, and then also safe medical male circumcision, and that's also a term that's used in the medical literature. 
Um, the more kind of unmarked term that most people use is just circumcision. They'll often use it in, in terms of a word derived from their local language. In the case of where I lived, the word was gotana, to cut, and so the, the term for it is just a cutting. Young boys at the age of um, between 14 and 16, depending on the case, uh, get initiated, get ritually circumcised uh, during the, the breaks, Christmas breaks and Easter breaks from school, particularly in the last two years of their high school or before going into high school in some cases. And this picture I've chosen because it, it shows them all kind of in a uniform. Now, these are these are boys who are, are, are all on the older side of things, but they have been circumcised as a, a group. They might have been cousins or something. And typically what you see is you see these young men, they go into their circumcision, they disappear in a house for a seclusion period for about a month, and they come out with great fanfare, big party, and they're given new clothes, and they're changed. They look very pale from being in the light, and, and then they, they kind of form a group, you know, and they're given new they're given new adult clothing. And in the center of this picture, you see another man. This is usually a person who is considered um, their carer during the time that they're in seclusion, when they're in their, their house recovering from the operation. And there's various words for that in different languages. Um, the, the language that, that where I lived is Mugwati, is a, a catcher, or even a babysitter. You might even call it a babysitter. And um, these young men, they, they have a strong identity that is formed inside them as a group, often as a result of their circumcision, because the circumcision marks their body in a particular way. And so um, part of the big issue at stake in circumcision is this notion of provision. And that is to say this provision of, of cultural teaching and of um, material goods, particularly food, and also the building materials for which you, they would need to build a new house. Because most people, once they are circumcised, they no longer live with their parents. They are given a, a new house. Um, and so this idea of provision is linked in with kind of the social reproduction of the whole society. And this is also a place of lots of different kinds of conflicts. And I just wanted to touch about on some of the conflicts that are emergent and also there, because there are issues of social justice and of social relations. That is to say, they touch on culture and the law and the rights. Just before the pandemic, there was a very um, highly publicized murder of a young boy. His name was Giuliano Cagnogno. And um, this Cagnogno was um, uh, murdered, actually, during by the people who were looking after him, these atiri. The atiri, were those like that boy in the middle of the photo that we just showed you, they were charged with looking after the initiates, caring for their wounds, cleaning them, uh, attending to their food needs, and also teaching them various things. Uh, I mean, some of those things are seen as cultural uh, stories, myths, but the end result is to kind of socialize them as a asexual being, as a uh, social being, as a responsible being, and it's a kind of moral education, if you will. Now, this is a picture from the Standard, which is a, a Standard Online, which is a daily newspaper from Kenya. And you can see the headline, Guardian Angel from Hell, who dimmed a star too soon. And it's trying to capture the idea that the, the, the person who was most responsible for this young boy uh, killed this boy because of a conflict um, and this boy was immediately a kind of a, a focus of media attention because he was sitting his uh, primary education exams um, and he had just received his results and he was going to go into high school and he scored a, a very, very high score. So he was seen as kind of a, uh, a bright star. And as this newspaper makes it out that um, he was killed by a person who was supposed to counsel him. Uh, and guide him at that moment. Uh, and the fight and the, the murder that took place actually over a conflict, it turns out, over the supply of food, over provision, over the supply of food to those who were the young men who were looking after this boy. Um, and there was a complaint about the, the, the type of quality of food that was, was given to them 
And as a result of that uh, violence that was meted on this boy during uh, during this um, moment, he, he died of injuries. Now, when I did my research, um, quite frequently this happened. Uh, there wasn't at that time much of a response. Nowadays, the, the society is far more sensitive to this. Uh, these are things that are now discussed. At some point in time, it was kind of an elephant in the room, and it wasn't discussed. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that there's always a, a kind of a reason, uh, an understanding, whether it's sociologically understanding this um, type of violence or an ethnographic understanding of it, as struggles over provision, struggles over authority, struggles over the distribution of resources, power, um, rights, access, and opportunities. And often these um, are situations that um, provoke this kind of violence. It's now no longer seen as a kind of male-only uh, area of investigation. I'm, I'll just give a quick illustration. Once when we were looking after a young initiate, um, two of them actually, they became extremely infected uh, there was a great concern over their well-being, and I uh, tried to get them to the hospital, but the people who were looking after him refused to take him to the hospital um, because we, we had to make do of it because there would be women in, in the hospital. The nurses were largely women, and there was a sense of you know, concern about that. So we, we looked, we found a, a, a male um, medical practitioner he came, but for whatever reason, they, they become even sicker. They became even more infected. And it was actually a very dire moment. There was a lot of tensions. And, and, and I, I saw how in a number of different cases, very similar kinds of struggles over provision, over health, um, over care, often um, provoke these kinds of conflicts. And when I went looking through the kind of legal cases in the legal uh, archives, you could see a pattern of, uh, of this issue of conflict over provision um, and over uh, the meanings of, of, of discipline. So there are emerging conflicts. I'm not going to go into this very much because I'm just aware of our time, but it would seem at this moment that uh, there's a movement amongst uh, quite a lot of uh, female MPs and mothers to get involved in these um, issues and to raise them as public awareness looking at the, the justice issue in here. And um, the issue of botched circumcisions, that's circumcisions that, that end up uh, being performed very poorly and there's injury to the, the boy's genitals, or there happens to be an infection in which, they, in which they suffer. This is becoming a public issue. And some female MPs aligning themselves with networks of mothers are getting involved. And this is, is seen as a kind of a sea, sea change in terms of the, the discussions that are happening in Kenya about the care and, and provision for these boys. Um, mothers traditionally were, were seen as, as kind of apart from this process. In fact, parents, in fact, were seen as apart from this process. But now they're getting more involved and that's introducing sort of changes, institutional changes in how these circumcisions are being done. Uh, recently in, in Kikuyu parts of the country, in, amongst the Kikuyu, I should say, which are a majority uh, population, a large ethnic group, if you will, there is um, an emerging conflict between neo-traditional elders um, and, and charismatic or Pentecostal churches that are attempting to kind of create uh, a monopoly, let's say, over, over circumcision. I'm going to leave it at that. It's a very compelling story, the traditional um, male circumcision. But for me, the big issues are, are about provision, also about marriage. Um, so whether you're circumcised or not actually impacts or used to very much impact on uh, who you married. And whether you married someone who was circumcised or uncircumcised, but also spilled over into the political realm where people from a circumcising community would resist voting for those who were uncircumcised or those who didn't belong to their ethnic group, for example. And also the role of, of, of social discipline and forcible circumcision. I've actually written on that where about cases of violence uh, and murder actually happen as a, as a form of, of sort of socially 
disciplining or a form of vigilant vigilantism. And in any case, at the end of the day, often this has to do with the distribution of resources, about power, standing, esteem, um, and about rights as well. I want to shift gears a little bit. That's a bit of a context that I want to paint, because the first, the first thing we would need to know about this subject matter is that the majority of Kenyans are from circumcising communities. And there are groups of Kenyans that don't circumcise and haven't had a, a, a history of circumcision. And in fact, identify themselves as non-circumcising communities. And it's precisely these communities that were targets of this global health intervention called voluntary medical male circumcision. And the reasons for, for this to happen um, were that there were some observational studies, some of them going back a very long time to the colonial period, up until the 1980s, that would suggest that uncircumcised men were more susceptible to HIV infection. It was more recently observed in STD clinics, sexually transmitted disease clinics in Nairobi, the sort of peak of the, of the, the first wave of HIV infection in the late 80s. Um, and they, in these SD or STI clinics, I probably should call them to be more contemporary, this sexually transmitted infection clinics, they realized there was a pattern that many men who had a foreskin actually developed chancroid. This is a horrible, it's kind of a horrible discussion, but I mean, chancroids are, are wounds uh, on the penal shaft around the foreskin that um, are caused by, a, by a, a, a mixture of opportunistic bacteria and also virus, but they create like whole, basically doorways, pathways for HIV infection. And, uh, and there's a long case of SDI research on, on chancroid and a long history of, of associating the chancroid with circumcision, that, that circumcision would be um, an instant uh, answer, an instant uh, response to, to stopping chancroid infections in a population would be circumcision. And of course, in the First World War, for example, uh, there were mass circumcisions of troops before going out to the front or going out to uh, fight, in, especially in tropical areas, as, there was, as a, an effort to, to stop chancroids. There was also some other research about penile cancer um, that would suggest that men with foreskins had a higher susceptibility to, to penile cancers. And this was all observational studies. At that time, there had never been random controlled trials looking into this particular issue. So there was an argument floating around. Uh, it certainly was present in Nairobi and in, amongst the microbiology community in Nairobi in the late 80s when HIV was being discovered and, and people, because they didn't know what it was, uh, they were discovering what it was and they were, they were struggling against being low resource, but also you know, actively resisted by the, the Kenyan government at the time. Um, and these microbiologists at some point in time they started to make noises about the potential that, that circumcision might be an answer to HIV prevention. And then from around 2004, 2005, 2006, there were three random controlled trials. Now, random controlled trials are seen as controlled experiments with, with populations, a control population and another set of population they can compare data, uh, those who receive the treatment, those that don't receive the treatment, uh, amongst many other things. And these random controlled trials, they took place in three places. They were in Orange Farm in South Africa, which is in Gautang. It's, it's somewhere near, um, it's not far from Johannesburg. Uh, and then Rakai, Uganda. Rakai is a community that's on the, on the, the border of Lake Victoria on the Ugandan side. And then Kisumu which is on the border of Lake Victoria and the Kenyan side. Now, everyone knows that HIV reached epidemic uh, concentrations in South Africa, still is, a very high HIV prevalence area. 
and also around Lake Victoria. Lake Victoria, there was also very, very high infection rates. And Lake Victoria also happened to be a place where the communities around Lake Victoria, for cultural and historical reasons, were non-circumcised communities. And uh, these random controlled trials were started with some basis in on large and long-term public health interventions, both in Rakai and also in Kisumu. There was, let's, t let's say that there was already an infrastructure of health workers. There was an infrastructure of uh, global health institutions, researchers from, from globally connected universities that had a main funder or a main base somewhere in, in the United States and, uh, and, a, and a large teaching research institute in, in East Africa. The one in South Africa um, was a little bit different. It was started in a town that was known for, for being a place of high infection because there was lots of labor migrants from lots of different countries. So it was a bit of a different context. But these were all presented as random controlled trials and they came out with this result that uh, no one could really believe, but that, that circumcision uh, prevented a 60% reduction of the rate of HIV infection from a female to a male. That's what the, 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 the literature that was published as a result of that, that's what the claim was, that, that, that circumcision would reduce HIV infections by 60%. That is debated, but it was the claim. And as a result of that, there was a very quick scaling up and rolling out of this intervention across Eastern and Southern Africa. Uh, and the target was going to be 20 million uh, young men. That was seen to be a significant enough amount of men to have a measurable impact on reducing HIV infections. And so it, it garnered a lot of support and the World Health Organization, they signed it off and it was scaled up and it became a big possibility uh, for HIV prevention. However, it also came with the advent of the ARVs, the antiretroviral uh, ARTs, the antiretroviral therapies. So they rolled out ARTs at exactly the same time. But there was an incentive for the people who were backing the circumcision to go forward with that. And, and, and it was very effective in the sense of it being rolled out very quickly. And so this community that lived in Kisumu, which I've been visiting uh, uh, in this recent project, they um, initially resisted it because it wasn't part of their culture. And, and that's what the argument was. It wasn't part of their culture and uh, it was something imposed. It was something from without. And there was a lot of effort to kind of mobilize people and to, and to persuade people that it was the right thing to do and so forth. And uh, so the, the big winner's narrative is that, that they were won over by the evidence and decided it was a thing that they wanted to participate in. And as a result of that, the Luo um, have been subject to the most, uh, the most mobilization for voluntary medical male circumcision. Again, this is a community that doesn't um, that doesn't circumcise. But there's for me three. Just 30 give minutes. A warning: thirty minutes. Excellent. Okay, please. I'm gonna try and I'm gonna try and and do this. I'm almost halfway, so that sounds that's that's a good that's a good sign. Uh, I hope you're all still there. Um, so the three for me the three issues that are, you know, I think really real talking points and and really important to look at in much more detail is the decolonial agenda, the first thing. Uh, the second thing is the question of consent. You know, to what extent are people who are subject to voluntary medical male circumcision aware fully of, of the implications and, 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 and the larger issues around uh, making choices? And then also the last uh, issue, which I, I really would like to focus on in this few minutes that I have at the end, is on the polarization of the of, of the scientific community and of doing research in this. And what I mean by polarization is that a researcher either gets called into the gets pulled into either being anti-circumcision or pro-circumcision. It's very difficult to tread a kind of. Uh, it's very difficult to deal with the ambivalences on both sides. You get kind of pulled socially into one or the other. 
And to deal with the decolonial agenda, I think, is, is, as a social justice issue, it's very important because it's actually about global health. And I remember a colleague of mine, Jeff Banda, listened to him answer a question in a seminar we had in, in Edinburgh. Uh, he's a former, he was at one time at the OU. And he was saying the problem with global health, he was saying, is that global health is, is a way of protecting the United States and Europe by having interventions in Africa. That the rationale for global health is actually a geopolitical thing, that it is, and it's a colonial thing, because it's about controlling diseases over there so they don't come here. And of course, immediately the, the parallel there is about migration, right? So you got, I mean, a, a good parallel for me would be to look at the, 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 the response to the migration to Europe, the migration crisis to Europe by sending troops to Mali, French and American troops to Mali, eh, ostensibly to fight jihadis, but really to control the smugglers who are getting people across the Sahel into boats in Libya that are then going out into the Mediterranean. This is a preemptive thing. And, and so again, there are these arguments that, that are being said about the decolonial agenda for global health is that global health really is about creating these pockets of, of networks and in, in the, in the global health infrastructure in order to control diseases at source so that they don't go further afield. And, uh, I thought Jeff's uh, comment was actually very appropriate for the kind of context that I work in, uh, because I'm just going to share a screen with an image here, because it is in some cases also what most of my Kenyan friends said. They said this is an imposition. This circumcision is it comes from white man. It comes from from you guys. You guys are the ones that take people to hospitals and circum Can you see that? I'm sorry. Can you see this picture? No, not yet. Oh, okay. Hang on. Yeah, I think it's loading now. Thank you. We can see it. Okay. Let's see if I can make that full screen. There. This is a picture of an intervention with uh, Voluntary medical male circumcision, and you can see this young boys, they've got their information leaflets, they're in school uniforms, you know that they're, they're young people, they're probably between the ages of 14 and, and 16. And you see a, a female mobilizer, and she's wearing this pink t-shirt that says, get circumcised, protect us from HIV. And the logo that is there, VMMC, is, is, a, is, a, is an organization that I've, I've done some research with and through. And it just, Jeff's comment about global, the decolonial agenda in, in global health makes me think about reading this t-shirt in a different way. Get circumcised, protect the United States from HIV. And I'm not the first person who's who've kind of made um, such kinds of comments. Not that we, we want to be uh, contrary to the United States, but the United States has a massive global health presence in Kisumu, in the, where I, I, I work. Uh, where I was working as a field worker, and um, and they, uh, Kisumu has become a kind of global health city. In some cases, some cities have become tech cities, other cities have become export uh, processing zone cities. This city has become a global health city, as has Rakai in, in Uganda, and so you can't avoid there being these global connections, and 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 the power politics of of that get implicated into the need to continue to roll out uh, a medical intervention that a lot of the local people are questioning in the first place because there are a are ARTs firstly there is prep pre exposure prophylaxis there is there's pep post exposure prophylaxis uh, readily available and so the question of the kind of circumcision becomes kind of redundant in people's minds but at the same time there's a lot of uh, at a micro sociological level, there's a lot of pressures on people to get circumcised. So the decolonial agenda is certainly there. Linked to what I was just mentioning about there being pressure on local people to consent to getting their children circumcised, uh, there's been all kinds of research on um, medical or public health research on the ethics approvals and, and consent. And, and this is a kind of... Um, it's a very contentious field, but the issue of consent is something that is becoming an emerging concern. 
because one of the more difficult um, issues to deal with, of course, is about bodily autonomy in different cultural contexts. It's um, fine and well to speak of an individual's right to bodily integrity and bodily autonomy, um, because those debates emerged out of the neonatal circumcision debate. But it's a bit different when you have a, a young man who wants to be sexual and wants to be included in his community and wants to be able to marry whoever he wants. That's a different kind of issue. Um, and so the question of culture and, and bodily autonomy isn't something that's been dealt with very, um, I would say, consistently. So consent is an issue that is certainly one of these social justice issues. But the one I want to end with and the one I want to focus on is about polarization. Um, and, it, and maybe it's particular to the kind of research that I'm doing or the kind of research that I was doing in the sense that male circumcision is a controversial topic. And um, and I guess I was I, w I guess I was successful with Welcome Trust as a funder, partly because I was addressing this question of, of being caught in the middle. You know, what happens when you're you're neither pro-circumcision, you're not anti-circumcision, you're not a relative relativist either. You're looking to find out how it's possible to scale up an intervention of such a size given this polarization. How is that possible? How does that work? How do you get consensus when there is so much uh, controversy? So how do you produce consensus within an already controversial field? And not just controversial in recent years, controversial since first century Palestine. It's been controversial for a very long time. And for me, that's an intriguing question. And I think that's what helped me, I think, get some funding because I was trying to negotiate this middle ground. It turns out to be almost impossible because uh, polarization occurs in, 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 in a political context. And when you enter into something, you're always being called into, a, into a, one camp or the other. Uh, I'm thinking, I'm not a very popular theorist, of course, nowadays, but I was thinking of the work of uh, Louis Althusser when he was talking about ideological state apparatuses. And he used this idea to make us think about ideology. And he was using the idea in French as uh, interpolation. It's a horrible word, what a horrible abstract word. But the, the simple idea of interpolation is what happens when someone calls you, when someone calls your name. They say, they say Les or Umet or Jamie, and you, you hear your voice and you turn. And he was saying that ideology is kind of like that, kind of captures you. And for me, that was very important in understanding the dynamics of, of the research I was involved in, because I knew this polarization was there. And I wanted to find a way of, of, of talking to many different people. I didn't want to be associated with one camp or the other camp. I wanted access to different kinds of people's perspectives. And so I had to I had to dance this very delicate dance amongst all of these different people. And um, even in Kenya, in some societies, they talk about how culture captures people. It, it's like a, it makes you captured. It brings you in. And I found this is the same thing with both the anti-circumcision people and the pro-circumcision people. They try to capture you. And I didn't want to be captured. And there's a, a very subtle process that pervasively or it's pervasive throughout all of the discussions about male circumcision and it is this polarization it is there in the bureaucratic procedures so let me give you an example um for when i was trying to get a research permit no first when i was trying to get an affiliation to get a research permit i ended up with a public health organization and they were conducting these circumcisions. And it was very difficult for me to negotiate where I stood in relation to that. And they couldn't understand it. To begin with, they couldn't understand it. They said, we're willing to work with you, but we don't understand where your research fits within our needs and our, our, our agenda. And I had to rewrite my proposal many, many times. And it's a very subtle process. And I don't, I don't mind being reflexive and honest about this. It ended up taking out what I thought was some of the more interesting research questions I was asking about ambivalence within controversy. And I started to become more medicalized in my approach so that the sort of pro formas and the, and the, the, the human research ethic committees and the, 
and the in institutional review boards that I was getting involved with turned my nice medical humanities project into a medical research project that was going to be situated within a kind of pro-circumcision uh, organization. And start, just to say five more minutes. Five minutes, okay. And, and so this also feeds into the getting research permits, you know, if you're seen as, as with the anti-circumcision uh, camp, let's say, it's very unlikely that you're going to be given a research permit. But also I've been picking up in terms of funding. So the subtle ways in which the polarization is implicated in funding. Why did Wellcome Trust fund me? They funded me because I was trying to find this middle ground. That would have been an implication if I had come out and been either anti-circumcision or pro-circumcision. And then also finally, in, in terms of the, the scientific peer reviews, it's incredible how we police one another in our academic writing. When it comes to peer review, we're maybe not aware of it, but when someone has um, a, a set of assumptions that are working inside of them, it's conveyed in, in the process through which they approach peer review. So when your work is being reviewed on this topic, people are trying to say, which camp do you fit into? And they're, they're discomforted when you don't fit into either camp. And if you fit into the wrong camp, then your work is basically rejected. So I've experienced all these kind of very subtle, um, subtle ways in which you're captured into this sort of controversial topics. And I guess the way that I would set this up is, um, I talk to lots of different people. I, I do want to continue this research, even though it won't be in an active phase, it'll be in kind of more writing and reflective way. But for me, this question of polarization is, is very important because I don't believe that we can, I think polarization makes it impossible for us to address some of the real social justice issues, which I see very much at the basis of, of the reason why I'm doing this research is because when I was doing the research many years ago, I saw what happened within families and quite often the main conflicts were around the distribution of resources, gender power, um, relationships. It was around provision, it was around masculinity, definitions of masculinity. And I believe the same kinds of issues are being played out in this medicalized intervention. And there's just simply not really a literature that's picking it up because uh, there's an implicit polarization of the academic debate. And um, I'm, I'm trying to find a way through all of that um, it's not an easy um, topic to do, but I believe that that uh, there is a way to do that. And um, it'd be interesting to hear our, our discussion as a kind of way of, of conclusion that, you know, in this topic, the, the big issues, the big issues that need to be addressed are the decolonial agenda, uh, the, the consent issues, and also the polarization.